Hello, everybody. Welcome. I'm Benjamin Powell. I'm the director of the Free Market Institute here at Texas Tech University. Thrilled to see you all out here tonight. Free Market Institute was founded about eight and a half years ago to promote the teaching and study of free enterprise economics here at Texas Tech and around the world. And as part of that, uh, we have these public lecture series. And I got to say, it's been wonderful to be at Texas Tech this past year, where we've actually been allowed to have a public lecture series, unlike many universities around this country. Uh, and tonight, uh, we've all been allowed to increase capacity and have more of you in for this very special event. Uh, so thank you all for t uh, turning out for it. So let me introduce tonight's speaker, Faris. Uh, Yenmi Park was born in North Korea in the early 1990s. She grew up under the harsh conditions of this country's socialist dictatorship. Her family's condition was further jeopardized and literally dealt with starvation after her father was arrested in 2002 for engaging in illegal trading in the black market and sentenced to hard labor in a prison labor camp. In any free society, her father would have simply been recognized as an entrepreneur. But in North Korea, engaging in capitalist market trading is a criminal activity. At age 13, Yenmi, her mother, and her older sister made the courageous decision to escape from North Korea. She had a harrowing two-year experience in China before making it to Mongolia and on to freedom in South Korea and eventually the United States. After escaping, Yenmi educated herself, and I should say, by the way, I learned today she had studied three years of economics at the university level as part of that. We like that here. Uh, and uh, she's become an outspoken critic of the North Korean government and an activist for human rights. She became an internationally recognized speech speaker after her passionate speech about her experiences and the brutality of the North Korean regime at the One Young World Summit in Dublin in 2014, which went viral. Since then, her speeches have been viewed online more than 320 million times, and counting since we're live streaming this as well. She's published a deeply personal book about her experience titled In Order to Live, A North Korean Girl's Journey to Freedom. The BBC has named Yunmi one of the top 100 global women. Please join me in welcoming this courageous person and eloquent ad uh, advocate for human freedom and dignity, Yunmi Park. But it took me to be free, you know, to be uh, having a dignity in my life, and like what it took. And I was thinking, so I think if there's one audience gonna understand what it takes to be free, these people are gonna be because you literally risked your life today to see me. <laughs> so see, risking your life is not that hard. <laughs> it's pretty easy. Uh, so I'm coming from a country where there is no vocabulary for love, freedom, and human rights. So it's almost like irony that I think you are the one who should be supposed to tell me what freedom is. So it's very humbling for me to be on this stage telling you what freedom is and why it matters. Uh, so now I'm 27 years old, and I feel like 2,000 years old, <laughs> and I was I became very spiritual after, through, through my journey because I know in my heart that the fact that I'm standing here right now, can you guess uh, right now how many North Koreans are in America? So North Korea has been oppressed for almost 80 years. So guess how many escaped to America? Just over 200 people. And so, am I the first North Korean you are ever meeting in your life? Can you raise your hands? Exactly, so I'm a unicorn. <laughs> I'm a ray of speech right now. <laughs> and so this is like really a different planet. North Korea is not even a country we are talking about. When people say, tell me about your culture shock. It's like, there's no culture shock. Like that was a different planet. How do I have a culture shock coming from like time traveling? And I asked God, you know, whatever you call God is, it can be anything. And why does North Korea exist? Like, why this horrible place? The United Nations says, what is happening to North Koreans is a holocaust. 
and then why is it is this way? And then one day I thought, well, God says there's things happen for everything for a reason, right? Maybe North Korea exists today to remind all of us what happens to us when we do not value individual liberty. It's a great reminder that's what happens to people. So let me talk to you about how I came here today, standing here, and, and what North Korea really is. I was born in 1993, uh, after the Soviet Union collapsed. And growing up there, I didn't even know the word oppress, like oppression. So now I went to a university at Columbia University of New York. So many people are passionately talking about how they are systemically oppressed. And I'm like, you know, you know that word oppression, you're not oppressed. Because <laughs> in North Korea, we have no clue that we are we live like less valuable than animals. Uh, in that situation, I had a very loving parent. I had a one older sister. And in that country, the very first thing that my mom taught me as a young girl was that not to even whisper because the birds and mice couldn't hear me. I'm going to tell you why dictators are obsessed controlling your speech. So in North Korea right now, literally, what, can, what you say can get you executed. And not only yourself, the three generations of your family. And this is why I'm so scared right now in America in the name of uh, inclusion and love and not offending anybody. They keep canceling speeches. And because if you control the speech, it leads to controlling your thoughts. And if you control your thoughts, you can be a dictator. So in North Korea, like the, my mom told me that the biggest weapon, the most dangerous thing that I had in my body was my tongue. This tongue can get so many people executed for saying the sleeping the wrong words. And North Koreans have become masters at even deceiving themselves, like doing even double think. So when I was in North Korea, I was a true believer of everything. I truly believe that my dear leader would not go to the bathroom, <laughs> right? <laughs> He's God. He can do miracles. And a lot of people try to understand North Korea in a perspective as a country. But do you know that North Korean regime copied the Bible? They literally copied the Bible. So basically, they made the Kim Il-sung, the first king, as God. And he loved us so much, he gave us his son, Kim, Kim Jong-il, which was Jesus Christ. But Jesus died, right? But his spirit is with us forever. He, can, he knows how many years we have, how many, what we are thinking. So that's what they tell us. Of course, Kim Jong-il dies, but his spirit is there with us forever. So if you see that many people believe in the Bible, it's not that surprising that people believe in Kim in North Korea. It's a religious court. And of course, they block every information that coming from other countries. That there's no internet in North Korea. And there's no even 24 hours electricity. So, like, literally, one of the public executions I saw was of my grandmother. She, I think, watched some Hollywood movie and gave it to her friends. And that's why she got executed. Reading a Bible gets you executed. And watching pornography also gets you executed. I don't know why, though. So people do not have any freedom. And when I came to America, it was funny. Like Everybody was like making fun of Kim Jong-un's haircut. And they were saying, that's ridiculous that Kim Jong-un requires North Korean men to have his own haircut. And of course, it's so funny. Like, But can you imagine this? How obsessed is the regime can be? They are even controlling what kind of haircut you get. The like people were asking me, so tell me what were you allowed to do then? And I literally one day I just sat down in my room, okay, let me come up with a list, the things that I was allowed to do as an individual in North Korea. Only thing that I was allowed to do was breathing. That was it. 
what you watch on TV, what you listen to, how you dance, what you wear, what you say, what you see, where to go, every single thing is determined by the vision. This is what happens when we do not have individual liberty. So, in the 90s, after Soviet Union stopped having North Korean regime, we, the regime one day decided that they were not going to feed us. So North Korea apparently is a socialist paradise. Regime takes care of everything. That's their design to make the country work. But in the 90s, the regime thought, okay, we don't need to keep everybody alive. Their goal of maintaining the system is keeping the 10% just happy. So it's like the Hunger Games in the movie. There's a capital, 13 other districts. They, on purpose, starve us. So we do not think about meaning of life. We do not think about what liberty is. Every single one of us constantly thinking, am I going to be able to be fed tonight? I know right now, after this lecture, nobody's here going to think about what you're going to eat for dinner, right? That's not your concern. But in North Korea, every single minute you exist in there, you're thinking about, can I find something to eat? That's how the regime maintains their control. So keeping all of us busy just surviving, and they can be a god in this 21st century. Uh, as a young girl, I'm seeing the advice on the streets every single day. And one thing that I still maybe to remember was, with my sister, I walked just passing this well. And there was a boy, I think now I'm thinking I'm like 27 years old, he was like maybe teenage time. He was, his, you know, like his intestines was coming up and he was still begging for food. In North Korea, children learn how to beg before they learn to speak. And right before my escape in 2007, I have really bad appendix, like a really bad pain that in my stomach. So my mom took me to the hospital. But of course, it's like socialist free healthcare in North Korea, and they don't even have x-ray machines. Literally a nurse using one meter in the hospital to inject everybody. And doctor was like rubbing my belly and then saying, okay, she has some appendix, we gotta remove it right now. That afternoon, they operated on me without any anesthesia. And the thing is, like, that's very common. In North Korea, like, that's like we really cut off bones without any anesthesia. And then after they, like, he opened my stomach, and turns out I didn't have any appendix. It was malnutrition and infection, but he still removed, removed my appendix. So just wait, I'm gonna go back and sue him. <laughs> I lost my appendix in North Korea. Um, and this is my last days of being there. Uh, right before this, from my hospital bed, of course we don't have an indoor bathroom, right? Like we have to go outside to go to the bathroom. There were just piles of human bodies dead. And this is, I don't know if you guys do this. so. In North Korea, right now, I'm 27 years old. I'm super old. <laughs> and like, sometimes when they call me like, you're like a girl, I'm, like, I'm not a girl. <laughs> Yesterday on the airplane, I was looking at the window. I was like, oh my god, I'm actually flying in the sky. And I was thinking about my friends back in North Korea. They're going to be mid-aged women. They're going to have a lot of disease and have several kids. And a lot of the children died from starvation. And they will not believe what I am he having here. So in that country, after my this surgery in this part of body, my mom was asking the nurses, why are you not moving those bodies? And the nurse was saying, oh, we don't have gas to move them. And what I still remember is that this lady was wearing this, like some flower print the tent. And you see rats eating human eyes first. I don't know why they do that. But children is catching those rats there. Because for us, seeing those human bodies are so something we are used to. We don't even think that's like abnormal. And I have so
so many single bodies that like when you look at them, nothing is left in them. They are so, so left, it's nothing. It's the saddest thing you can see. And this is like people are being treated in this 21st century. And that's when I realized I have to escape for a bowl of rice. Because when I was in North Korea, I didn't even know that humans were living like this. So this is not like what I was risking my life for. My just motivation was as simple as that. I want to be fed. Like, my last wish was, if I can eat until I feel full, like, I would be happily going to die. Because I never ate until I felt full. So I never knew like how much I could eat in my tummy. And my sister and I were playing these games. Like, I said, like, I can eat a bucket of bread. And she's like, I can eat the mountains of bread. And like, I can eat zillions of bread. Like, I don't know how much a human can eat. And that's like what North Koreans are doing. When they escape, people are saying, like, oh, you guys are going to escape for freedom. No, that's not what we are doing. We literally escape to be fed. And that's what we are risking our lives for. So in 2007, my sister at 16 years old, she escapes with her friend. And after my surgery, I come out and to my mother, I was 13 years old. I also escaped that frozen river to China. But you know like North Korea, the entire country is a concentration camp. In those borders, Kim Jong-un literally buries landmines. And I know I'm not sure if this is gonna like relate to you. Like, so Kim Jong-un built this highly electrified fences, like the concentration camp, so nobody can escape. Luckily, the lady who was helping me, she was a human trafficker, and they uh, brought the guards. Mm -hmm. So we crossed that first river not knowing what we were getting into. But when you're so desperate, you don't even care. Right? Like, you're going to die anywhere. Like, why do you even ask why are you hurting me? What's going to happen to me in China? Like, that's not even a question. So it's because you, you, your destiny was 13 in North Korea. If I didn't escape, you would not see me right now. I would have been dead like, long, long ago. And nobody would know like, that I existed. So while in China at 13, you do my mother. Of course, the first thing I see is my mother being raped. And now I'm thinking, like, we were talking about rape and all these victims, blah, blah, but in North Korea, there is no sex education. So when my mom was being raped, I didn't even know that was a rape. It was like, it looks horrible, but I don't know what that is. And then they told us that uh, because of the one-child policy in China, there are right now more than 30 million young men cannot find wives in China. So this man is women, and they buy us. And this is a modern day slavery. And then they sold my mom for $65. And they sold me for less than $300. Because I was a virgin, and somehow that's very valuable in China to sleep with a virgin. And I was separate from my own mother. And this is what every North Korea goes to almost. Right now, like you see me, the girls just like, like me, 300,000 of us are being sold in China daily. If you go Chinese Google like Baidu, you can order North Korean girls as a sexual slaves every single day. And all these social justice warriors, nobody in America wants to have this conversation about. Um, so I was sold after I was being bought by another human trafficker. I tried to kill myself. There was no more meaning for me to exist in this world. And then he said, if I become his mistress, he was going to help my mom and buy my father from North Korea. And, and then that was the bargain we had. So I stopped being a child at 13 and I did become his mistress. So he did bring my, pull my mom back from the farm that he sold from my sick father. And then in China, like, of course, I don't know how do I get out of China. Like, there was always constant threat of being caught there. And then one day I met a North Korean fellow defector woman. She said, oh, there's a way of escaping, and which is 
eventually crossing across Gobi Desert to Mongolia from China. And the group that were helping us were actually missionaries. I have a very complicated relationship with those missionaries because, so those missionaries, like North Korea is the number one Christian persecuted country. And you are going to be executed for having a Bible, so these people want to spread the gospel to North Korea. And then they, my price, I mean, the bargain was me becoming Christian, then they're going to save me. And I thought, I was like, back then, I was like, why do I have to keep believing in something to survive? I literally got out of Kim and song, and now I suddenly believe in God and Jesus. But North Koreans are very good at believing in things. I became unbelievable Christian. I wasn't even lying. I, I think when you want to try to survive, you can't even believe in rocks. That's how powerful the will to survive is. After by proving my faith to these missionaries, they told me how to go to Mongolia, which was getting a one compass in 2009, minus 40 degrees. And they told me if you cross eight wire fences in the desert, that would be Mongolia. And then your job is finding a you know, human being, like Mongolian soldiers. Then tell them you want to go to South Korea. Luckily, I survived. I found the soldiers. A few months later, I was sent to South Korea. So at 15, for the first time, I went to the world where there was freedom. But most people think, oh, that is an awesome story, the end of the journey, right? Freedom is amazing, but no. Freedom was so painful. Learning freedom was so difficult. I was literally saying, if there was a guarantee that I was not going to be executed, and if there was a guarantee that I'm going to be fed, like at least frozen potato every single day, I want to go back to North Korea. Because in North Korea, we never learned how to think for ourselves, all our lives. And I know this is like free market institute that sponsored this event. Let's talk about free market. <laughs> uh, so North Korea, trading is illegal. That was a crime my father committed, was trading and sent to prison camp. Why do they stop letting you not having free market? Not, why are they blocking this thing? Because when you start trading for yourself, that means you are going to start thinking for yourself. You are going to be thinking about what is good for me, for my business. But in North Korea, saying the word I is crime. There is no I. There is only we. So that was a hard thing going to South Korea. There were studies saying, like, introduce yourself. Like, I, they would keep saying, I like this, I like this, and then in North Korea, even though I say I liked red color, I said we like red color, we like kimchi. So individualism is that. And going to South Korea for the first time, you gotta be responsible, you gotta be, you know, thinking for yourself. That was very overwhelming. But the biggest challenge was not even this, like learning, you know, how to take a subway. Okay, I remember going to South Korea, seeing the bank for the first time. I literally thought they were putting a human inside an ATM machine. <laughs> and then somebody giving me money out of the little doll, right? And then I was like, they are so mean, why would you do that? <laughs> and that's how I literally knew about the modern world. But that was, that was easy to learn. The hardest thing was, how do I trust again? Because when I got there, they told me kings were dictators, they were liars, they were enslaving us. And then there was everything that I believed in North Korea was a lie. And I was thinking, so if everything that I was taught was a lie, how do I know what you're telling me is not a lie? <laughs> exactly, right? Like, it's really, it drove me really crazy for a while. Like, how do I ever trust anything ever again? What hurt me was reading George Orwell's books, Animal Farm, in 1984. And that really helped me to understand. And one thing that I also learned in the animal farm was not just how the dictators were controlling people, but what happened to my people. I see so much. Unfortunately, I will not give this lecture before the pandemic, but during the pandemic, after going to university in America, I see a lot of similarity that I saw in my country now happening in America. I'm not trying to be the alumnus, not at all. 
but I do see a lot of common similar things. For instance, like saying the wrong thing is a problem, right? Like in order to find truth, humans we need to talk with each other to find get there. But now because we are not trying to offend anybody, that is not allowed. That means we cannot think anymore. And uh, studying at Columbia University, I was like, my teachers were sending me this like warnings email. I said, okay, today in our coverage, we're gonna talk about the wave, blah, blah. If it triggers you, don't do reading and don't even come to class. And it's just like, what? <laughs> and, and people were saying like, okay, so you are a slave, you're a wave, and how are you so normal? This is a question I all the time get. Like, it's like, you are so normal, like what's wrong with you? And I'm like, what is wrong with you? <laughs> Why can't you not be normal? <laughs> and they're like, how are you not resentful? I was like, Why well, you should be? Almost like here in America right now, people are obsessed finding ways to be offended. And I'm like, yeah, like uh, saying a lot of words that like my pronouns are horrible because my English is like my third language. And people say, my, I'm a gender fluid. Like every, before class we do this, like what pronouns are you gonna be called? And they say, call me they. And I'm not used to incorporating my sentences yet. Not because I'm, I don't wanna be including them, just I'm not good at it yet. And this is like what they're talking about all day long. And I'm like, oh my God, this is like the end of civilization. <laughs> Seriously, if that's your problem, oh my gosh. I was so shocked. And now also, in North Korea, I was saying, what you do has consequences as an individual, right? Like if you say the wrong thing, it's not only you get executed, three generations of your family get executed. Because my great-great-grandpa owned a little bit of land because he was a landowner. My mom's side, the status in the society became very bad. So this is irony. North Korea started the communism to make everybody, everybody equal. But now they came up with 15 different classes. It became the most unequal society in our world right now. It's, and then they still call them socialist paradise. So now like, I'm here in this country, I know that like, we didn't do good things in the past. We did good and bad, all of it. But now with the slavery, people are talking about your ancestor did this. Like, but how does it relate to me? Like, I was not alive back then, and people, this, this thing is called the guilt by association. By being associated, you are guilty. And now I'm saying, like, there's a white guilt, like, privilege. Like, no, what is that thing? This is about, like, North Koreans do make me guilty because my great great grandfather did not understand the communism back then. He owned the land. And I didn't do anything to contribute to his decision, right? So, this is, like, what I'm thinking now is, like, we are all on the same boat. Because being free, I think that's what I didn't understand like when I came to America. When you guys are born here, your natural state is having food and being free. For my natural state is not having food and not being free. So for most of our existence as a humanity, it's a very unnatural thing for the individuals to have this power. And every civilization force, Right? There's no guarantee that Western democracy is not going to fall. And I, I really someday think like there are so many people, my friends, like I always think the millennials have some trusting issues. <laughs> like we tried communism every single time and it failed. We tried free market every single time and it succeeded. But they don't believe it. And I said, you got to talk to your therapist about your trusting issue. <laughs> the facts are very clear right here. <laughs> Something works, something doesn't work. And now, of course, like everybody, you know, I don't fit their category. I should be resenting the world. I'm not. I'm very grateful. And I know why right now is here, not because I did something rare or anything brave. I was just lucky to be here, I mean, to make it. And also, I met so many people who cared about another human being. Even though I was saying those Christians that I had some hard feelings with them, but now I'm thinking they were the most selfless humans that I met because they were going to China to save North Koreans. 
and they will be in life sentence now in China, and they die in Chinese prison. And so we cannot like just so so in things like in North Korea, words doesn't have much power because you know the regime using words been doing so many tricks. It doesn't have a lot of meaning there. And now like I see that too in the West, the words doesn't have much power. Like everybody's right for like justice. And I think that's is why like maybe God keeps North Korea that way. And I'm really worried like when we go to the moon with Elon Musk. We're gonna leave North Koreans behind. And I'm like, we still haven't explored our world yet. There are more than half of, like, I mean, they said, like, data says 60% of human beings on Earth right now are not free. So, what we have is very rare. And I truly wonder when we all became under the authoritarian rule, like, who's gonna fight for us? Machines, puppies, polar bears, nobody gonna fight for our freedom if we don't do it ourselves. I think that is why I'm asking you to care about freedom and North Korean people's human rights because we are the only people who can do it, nobody else can do it. And when we become not free, we just hope the people who's free gonna fight for our freedom and to be the voice for our, our situation. So I'm very grateful that you flew so far, some of you, and came to see me and risking your literally life to hear about what is happening to my people. So thank you again, everyone. I'm very grateful for your like presence here today.